How's it going everybody? I'm Nick Maia and this is The Weekly Fix, the show where we round up all the gaming and entertainment headlines you may have missed this week. Wow, when you look at the time, it's already Saturday and there's a whole lot of news to get to. From everything Call of Duty, because that seems to be going well, to the recent news about Netflix's Witcher series, that new thing Ubisoft wants you to get comfortable with, another record broken by that Grand Theft Auto 6 trailer, and a whole lot more. All right, I've talked enough, we've got a lot to get to this week, and it looks like it's news in time. Activision has issued a warning to Call of Duty players. It will now close the game down if it detects aim assist on mouse and keyboard. Activision says Call of Duty's anti-cheat tech, dubbed Ricochet, will now close the game app on PC if it detects a mouse and keyboard player activate aim assist. This works across Modern Warfare 3, Modern Warfare 2, and Warzone. Aim Assist is one of the hottest topics within the competitive shooter space. It is designed to offer a helping hand to console players with keeping their reticle on target and, depending on the severity, can see the reticle move quite a bit as it tracks enemy players. Aim Assist, generally speaking, is not meant for mouse and keyboard players who benefit from the increased speed and accuracy their PC-focused control scheme provides. Call of Duty players have used unauthorized third-party hardware to benefit from Aim Assist and reduce recoil while using mouse and keyboard for years. Last year, Activision said Ricochet would detect their use and bans would follow for repeat offenders. This latest development is thought to target Rewazdi, an increasingly popular gamepad mapper software used to reassign the keyboard, mouse keys, and controller buttons. It creates a virtual controller which in turn convinces the game to enable aim assist. Activision's warning comes as the Season 1 Reloaded update prepares for launch across Warzone and Modern Warfare 3. Now I know not every Call of Duty player on PC is a cheater, but I do like this IGN comment that says PC stands for probably cheating. Earlier this week, Twitch laid off 35% of staff, which amounted to over 500 members losing their jobs. Twitch boss Dan Clancy remarked in a blog post that we still have work to do to right-size our company. He went on to say that even though they did cut costs in 2023, Twitch is still bigger than they need it to be. So while the Twitch business remains strong for some time, now the organization has been sized based upon where we optimistically expect our business to be in three or more years, not where we're at today. As with many other companies in the tech space, we are now sizing our organization based upon the current scale of our business and conservative predictions of how we expect to grow in the future. Just as a quick refresher, Twitch laid off 400 staff members last year. Clancy went on a live stream to further speak on the matter and stated, I'll be blunt, we aren't profitable at this point. Amazon has been extremely supportive of Twitch. Big thing for being sustainable over time is ensuring we don't lose money. That's a big part of my job because that's going to be what makes sure we can be here for the long term. In 2023, Twitch paid out over $1 billion to streamers and Clancy specified that Twitch was no longer doing big contract deals to streamers to keep them on their platform. He said the move made no sense and that the cost of keeping those creators on Twitch would be hurting their revenue more than the streamers could bring in. The positive out of this is that Clancy reassured viewers that Twitch is unlikely to get cut by Amazon despite the lack of profitability. He said Amazon is very bullish on Twitch. They've been investing heavily in Twitch. Clearly, none of that investment went towards Clancy's streaming setup. I'd really like Amazon to put their money where their mouth is and invest in the people who work at Twitch and put their passion and care into maintaining the company. We're only 12 days into the new year and we're seeing major layoffs across the industry. My heart goes out to those affected and I really, really do hope that they're able to find work soon. An executive at Assassin's Creed maker Ubisoft has said gamers will need to get comfortable not owning their games before video game subscriptions truly take off. Speaking to GI.biz to discuss the launch of the new Ubisoft Plus Premium and Ubisoft Plus Classic subscriptions, Philip Tremblay, director of subscriptions at Ubisoft, explained what needs to happen before subscription services become a more significant slice of the video game business. Tremblay said, I don't have a crystal ball, but when you look at the different subscription services that are out there, we've had a rapid expansion over the last couple of years, but it's still relatively small compared to the other models. One of the things we saw is that gamers are used to, a little bit like DVD, having and owning their games. That's the consumer shift that needs to happen. They got comfortable not owning their CD collection or DVD collection. That's a transformation that's been a bit slower to happen in games. As gamers grow comfortable in that aspect, you don't lose your progress. If you resume your game at another time, your progress file is still there. That's not been deleted. So it's about feeling comfortable with not owning your game. I still have two boxes of DVDs. I definitely understand the gamer's perspective with that, but as people embrace that model, they will see that these games will exist, the service will continue, and you'll be able to access them when you feel like. That's reassuring. 
But what isn't reassuring is that when you're paying to access a game instead of own it, your access can be revoked at any time. The physical versus digital versus subscription debate is sure to continue as more publishers consider our perhaps inevitable all digital future. Last year, the leaked news of Microsoft's plan for a slim version of the Xbox Series X shocked gamers because it mentioned the hardware wouldn't have a Blu-ray drive. As Xbox boss Phil Spencer said at the time, these plans may have changed. Moving on, on yesterday's episode we were talking about how Ubisoft is waiting for players to really get comfortable with not owning their games so that subscription services like Ubisoft Plus can really take off. But one high-profile developer has come out strongly on the side of the traditional method of selling games. Sven Vinke, boss of Baldur's Gate 3 maker Larian Studios, offered a developer's view in a series of tweets that came down hard against a potential future in which subscription services are the dominant model. He said, whatever the future of games looks like, content will always be king. But it's going to be a lot harder to get good content if subscription becomes the dominant model and a select group gets to decide what goes to market and what not. Direct from developer to players is the way. He continued, we are already all dependent on a select group of digital distribution platforms and discoverability is brutal. Should those platforms all switch to subscription, it'll become savage. In such a world, by definition, the preference of the subscription service will determine what games get made. Trust me, you really don't want that. You won't find our games on a subscription service, even if I respect that for many developers it presents an opportunity to make their game. I don't have an issue with that, I just want to make sure the other ecosystem doesn't die because it's valuable. He isn't alone in casting doubt over video game subscriptions. During the Federal Trade Commission's battle to block Microsoft's $69 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard, PlayStation boss Jim Ryan claimed publishers don't like Game Pass. Take-Two and Activision have also expressed concern about releasing their games day one into subscription services, a tactic Microsoft employs with its first-party games and Game Pass. However, some developers have said subscription services, such as Game Pass, are invaluable to their success and even their survival. Miles Jacobson, boss of football manager maker Sports Interactive, recently applied Applauded subscriptions. He said, every studio is going to have different opinions on this, different studios will have different data, because different games work well in different situations. For us, it's nothing but positive. The simple fact is Game Pass and Apple Arcade have brought new people to the franchise that never played it before. I'm confident enough in our games to believe we will now have those consumers for a long time, whatever platforms we're on. Fiscally, it makes sense. Creatively, it makes sense. Multiple subscription services have emerged in recent years, with the likes of Game Pass, Sony's PlayStation Plus, and Nintendo's Switch Online, all providing access to a library of games for a monthly fee. There are even services from individual publishers like EA and Ubisoft. Time will tell how sustainable it all is. Foam Stars launches on February 6th as a month-long PlayStation Plus exclusive for PlayStation 4 and 5. The 4v4 Splatoon-style foam party shooter launches on PS Plus on February 6th and will remain on the service until March 4th. After that, Foam Stars will be sold from the PlayStation Store with a PlayStation Plus subscription required. We also learned that Foam Stars uses some AI-generated art. Speaking to VGC, Foam Stars producer Kosuke Okatani confirmed the game uses AI art for certain assets, but claimed most of the game is made by actual developers. Square Enix used controversial AI tool Midjourney, which turns text prompts into visual art, to create in-game album covers for music tracks. Okatani said, We experimented with Midjourney using simple prompts to produce abstract images. We loved what was created and used them as the final album covers players will see in the game. Everything else was created entirely by our development team. This only makes up around 0.01% of the game, or even less, Okatani claimed. The inclusion of AI in Foam Stars is perhaps unsurprising, given Square Enix president Takashi Kiryu has said that the company will be, quote, aggressive in applying AI and other cutting edge technologies to both our content development and our publishing functions. We recently played four hours of Foam Stars and found it to be a fun shooter packed full of character. Officially announced at the 2024 Smite World Championship, Smite 2 is in the works. The sequel is set to have the same core MOBA gameplay, but is being built from the ground up for the next generation. So I realize that some of you may not have played Smite or might not be familiar. So here's a quick overview. Smite is a MOBA like League of Legends, but uses gods from various lore origins as its characters. What really sets Smite apart is its third person camera. So rather than the top down view favored by most other games in the genre, you actually get to look over your shoulder. In my opinion, the perspective definitely adds a level of immersion and fights feel way more engaging compared to League. Smite launched in March 2014, so I'd say it's about time for an upgrade. 
Smite currently runs on Unreal Engine 3, and the sequel is built using Unreal Engine 5, and will bring gameplay improvements, new abilities for some characters, new UI, and I'm guessing some noticeably better visuals. Travis Brown, general manager at Titan Forge Games, describes Smite to you as a chance to go back, take all the learnings from 10 years of making Smite into one of the most successful multiplayer games of all time, and do it all strictly better. Five new gods are planned for Smite 2, starting with Hecate, the Greek goddess of sorcery, who will be available to play as part of the Smite 2 alpha playtest that is coming this spring. Also, if you end up disliking Smite 2, don't worry, Smite 1 will be available to continue playing. Smite 2 will not replace the original game and both games will get regular updates. <clears throat> Overwatch, take some notes. <clears throat> Anyways, what? Smite 2 is set to release on PC, Steam Deck, Xbox Series, and PlayStation 5 with full crossplay. If you're interested in trying out Smite 2, the signups for the alpha playtest are live right now. Today, GTA 6's debut trailer quickly overtook the likes of Red Dead Redemption 2 and Cyberpunk 2077, and has now overtaken Minecraft to become the second most watched video game trailer of all time. It's still far from the top spot though, which is held by a rather surprising title. The GTA 6 trailer, published on December 4th, now has more than 168 million views. Minecraft's trailer, which was published more than a decade before, on December 6th, 2011, has 167,800,171. This puts GTA 6, which is set to launch on consoles in 2025, as the second most watched video game trailer ever, also above the likes of Clash of Clans, Team Fortress 2, and its own predecessor, Grand Theft Auto 5. But the GTA 6 trailer isn't even halfway to overcoming the number one most viewed game trailer. That record belongs to a 2012 mobile endless runner called Subway Surfers. Now, if you're watching this video, there's probably a good chance you've never even heard of Subway Surfers. That's what most of the comments on IGN are saying. I, an elder gamer, have also never heard of it. But the only mobile game I play is Marvel Snap. In fact, Subway Surfers is one of the most popular games of all time with over 4 billion downloads. It was the fifth most popular Android game as of August 2023. Published in 2012, the trailer has more than 361 million views. So while GTA 6 has a long way to go to catch up to Subway Surfers, it is the most watched non-free-to-play mobile kitty game trailer ever. Alright, so to break down how absurd the number of views that trailer has generated, let's do some math. Fun, I know. If you take the trailer's 1 minute 30 second runtime, multiply that by 168 million, it would take you about 319 years to watch all of that. Not bad for a trailer that was released about a month ago. Anyway, it's about time for a quick break, but when we come back, we're leaving games and diving headfirst in the world of entertainment, with the latest on the next season of The Witcher, some Minecraft movie news, and a whole lot more. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We've got an update on the Minecraft movie starring Jason Momoa and Jack Black, as well as an explanation on why Expendables 4 bombed. No pun intended there. But before we get into all of that, let's check out the latest casting news for the next season of Netflix's Witcher series and why the newest Halo TV show trailer bothered so many people. All right, take it away. Netflix announced that Lawrence Fishburne will be joining the cast of The Witcher for its upcoming fourth season, playing the part of Fang favorite bloodsucker, Regis the Vampire. The news comes by way of an official announcement from the streamer. Fans of The Witcher video games likely know Regis best from his role in the Blood and Wine expansion, but he was first introduced in Andrei Sapkowski's third Witcher novel, Baptism of Fire, which is what season four is going to be adapting. In the lore, Regis is a higher vampire who's over 400 years old, and in that time he's become educated on a pretty wide variety of subjects, and he becomes a powerful ally to Geralt and company, and, you know, a pretty good friend too. While there's some skepticism about Liam Hemsworth replacing Henry Cavill as the Witcher's eponymous hero, Fishburne will likely be a highlight. If you're somehow not familiar with the works of Lawrence Fishburne, you need to watch more movies because he's in a whole bunch of them. It's unclear how big of a role Regis will actually have in season four, and there's still no word on when we can expect to see it, but it is officially in production, and Morpheus plays a 400-year-old vampire, which is good news if you ask me. Season 2 of the Paramount Plus Halo series is less than a month away, and while the latest trailer shows off plenty of cool stuff to get fans excited, there is one thing they're not too excited about, at least not in the good way, and that's seeing more of Master Chief's face. This isn't a new complaint, obviously, and the decision to show Master Chief, aka John117, without his helmet on was a major bone of contention in the first season, so you can't really blame fans for being a little baffled to see Paramount doubling down on that choice to promote season 2. 
As the top post on the Halo subreddit put it, how did nobody at the marketing department realize that this was a bad thing? The trailer features multiple shots of a helmetless and in one case armorless Master Chief, which makes him look less like the iconic video game character and more like, uh, I don't know, Pablo Schreiber, the guy who plays him, which is also the case for the promotional poster that was released alongside the new trailer. Back when season one premiered in 2021, Schreiber defended the choice to Tech Radar, saying, quote, you're not gonna be able to bring an audience along in a long form story without having access to a character's face, which tells you what they're feeling, how they think about everything. That access to a character's emotional life over the course of time is what makes you empathize and connect with a character. And that's great, except it's demonstrably false because look at The Mandalorian. That is another massively popular streaming series about a guy in cool armor who basically never takes his helmet off, except for one time, but his religion forbids him from doing so, and then he has to spend an entire season doing fetch quests to redeem himself because he took his helmet off for one time. He knew he wasn't supposed to, and he did anyway, and he got in trouble. And they just gave that guy a movie anyway, so clearly the helmet isn't that much of an issue. I personally don't have a dog in this fight because I never really got into Halo, but I completely get where fans are coming from. Boba Fett was always my favorite Star Wars character, and The Mandalorian is somehow a better Boba Fett show than the actual Boba Fett show that we got, where again, he spent a whole lot of his time with his helmet off, which seemed to kind of miss the point of why people like that mysterious character in the first place. Helmet stuff aside, the latest trailer does offer plenty of gritty action, so hopefully it can save face, so to speak. We'll find out when it premieres exclusively on Paramount Plus on February 8th. Napoleon Dynamite and Nacho Libre director Jared Hess is also helming the upcoming Minecraft movie, and during breaks between listening to Subwoofer Lullaby and Sweden, he's conducting interviews ragging on our boy Sonic. But don't worry, it's not the good-looking Sonic. Speaking to the Salt Lake Tribune, he said, quote, I think anybody that does any IP, they just want to avoid an ugly Sonic situation. I just can't disappoint the 10-year-olds or they're going to murder us. All right, hold on there. 10-year-olds aren't the only ones who play Minecraft. Like, I I spent countless hours leveling up my skills to spend on enchantments for my item. So when you say you don't want to disappoint the 10 year olds, that's an insult to everyone who's ever played the game and has been playing it since back then in 2009, my guy. Like the 10 year olds you're referring to weren't even around back then to experience the unique intricacies of the eld pack texture in the 1.0 beta. So I'd encourage you to acknowledge all the fans of Minecraft and work hard not to just disappoint them, but all of us, okay? Jeez. Now anyway, for context, Jared Hess is referencing the time back when uh, the first Sonic the Hedgehog movie released its initial trailer with a very off-looking Sonic the Hedgehog. Now fans came out to express their disdain for how the character looked, which made the production and creative team go back to the drawing board to rework his look to resemble his video game counterpart, and the fans just loved it. I loved it, I'm one of the fans. Uh, though I gotta admit, Ugly Sonic made an appearance in uh, that Chip and Dale live action movie, and he was brilliant in it. Considering Jared Hess's filmography, it doesn't seem like the Minecraft movie will be taking itself too seriously. And I'm curious to see how weird they're willing to get with the big screen Minecraft adaptation. Jason Momoa, Jack Black, and Jennifer Coolidge are all set to star in the upcoming Minecraft movie. Now, the question is, will they look like themselves or will they be blocky, voxelated versions of themselves? Or maybe some combination thereof? We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Either way, queue up the C418 and get excited. After years of development and multiple delays, Stalker 2 is delayed once again, but this time with a firm final release date, September 5th, 2024. Ukrainian developer GSC Gameworld opened up about the challenges the studio has faced, getting the apocalyptic PC and Xbox Series shooter up to scratch after a mixed reaction to its debut public showing last year. GSC Gameworld said in a tweet, From your insights, we figured out two key points, the one to celebrate and the one to consider seriously. The first one, the zone remains the zone, in its true beauty and after our likeness. The game absolutely feels and plays like Stalker. The atmosphere, the hardcore style, harsh and unwelcoming environments are ready to cook, and we can't be more grateful for these words, as they basically sum up both the key intention and the main inspiration for the project from the very beginning at the same time. The second one was, on the technical side of things, the game needs more time. Seeing the scope of polishing and understanding that we can't push your patience too much, we were absolutely dedicated to releasing the game in Q1 2024, and we worked extra hard to meet the release window. That, however, doesn't change the fact that at the beginning of this year, we still witnessed the certain amount of technical imperfections that hold Stalker 2 below the expected standards for the final experience our fans are waiting for. While there's absolutely no way to make another delay sound less dim, 
we decided to be clear about our reasons to postpone the game for the sake of yet another wave of polishing. It's fair to say the Gamescom 2023 build was rough. As IGN's Stalker 2 hands-on preview revealed, despite its Unreal Engine 5 base and prominent Microsoft support, the 15-minute Gamescom demo suggests that Stalker 2 still sits in the Eurojank category, the colloquial term for Eastern European games that are overly ambitious and technically wobbly. Here's hoping this final nine months is what the devs need to get Stalker 2 looking and playing its best. The Last of Us Part 2 Remastered is releasing in just a few days on January 19th, and Naughty Dog revealed some really fun news about the new Guitar Free Play mode. Naughty Dog posted on X slash Twitter that you can play the new mode with a familiar face. Who is that, you ask? It's the composer of The Last of Us games, Gustavo Santoalaya. It's actually a little bit funny. Santoalaya accidentally leaked the Part 2 remaster in July last year. In an interview with Blender, he said, in the new editions of the game, you can make me play certain themes. And well, I can't tell you anything else. I mean, he said a lot though. This was before any new editions or musical modes were even officially revealed. It's very funny, but I'm really glad Naughty Dog finally announced it. The remaster also comes with a roguelike mode called No Return, graphical improvements, DualSense integration, and Lost Levels with developer commentary. The Lost Levels are content cut from the original game, but are now included for the remaster with Jackson Dance, Boar Hunt, and most concerningly, Sewers. If you played and you remember that one underground level, I really do not want to go back there. No, I'm good. No, thank you. The PS5 remaster will cost 70 bucks brand new, but it's only a $10 upgrade for anyone who owns The Last of Us Part 2 on PS4 digitally or physically. Shifting gears from faces that you'll see too much of on streaming shows to faces that you won't see at all, Eduardo Franco, who played Argyle the Pizza Guy in season four of Stranger Things, has confirmed that he is not returning for the fifth and final season of the Netflix series. Fans were quick to point out that Franco was noticeably absent from a cast photo that was posted online to announce the production of season five is officially underway, and in a recent appearance on the Steve Varley show, Franco confirmed their suspicions, saying, quote, it's nice to hear that there's some concern, you know what I mean? But yeah, I never got a phone call, so yeah, I think that's it, you feel me? The cast of Stranger Things has ballooned steadily since season one. This time around, Linda Hamilton, AKA Terminator Sarah Connor, is popping up in season five in an undisclosed role, so it's not that surprising that some side characters might get further sideline, but it's still a bummer for anybody hoping for more Argyle. Then again, maybe this will change and they'll give him a call. Stranger Things 5 is still a long ways off and likely won't premiere until late 2025 at the very soonest. In other news, actor Dolph Lundgren apparently knows why Expendables bombed at the box office. I'm sorry, I don't know. It's like a four in the middle of Expendables. I don't know if the four is silent in Expendables 4, but whatever. Anyway, speaking to Screen Rant, he said, quote, I know Stallone wasn't involved like he usually is. He just played a character in it, and when he's in charge, the quality is going to be pretty good. It doesn't drop below a certain level. Expendables 4 was put through the ringer with various screenwriters touching the script. Now, Stallone wasn't involved in any of the writing, so he had very limited creative input, which likely left a lot to be desired. But honestly, it probably flopped because it's a 14-year-old franchise at this point, pushing well past its prime like some of its main cast members. Now, the rule of three should always be adhered to. Unless, you know, we're talking about the Fast and Furious franchise, like that's the only decades old original movie franchise that gets a pass for continuing well beyond its relevance. Also, I don't know if y'all know this, but there's there's apparently a Bill and Ted 4 movie being kicked around. If it gets made, honestly, Hollywood has officially lost its freaking mind. I'm Nick Maia, and that was your weekly fix. We'll be back next week with more of the biggest gaming and entertainment news. Take care.